All right, so um, today we start the uh, last um, special topic of the course, and I will call it contact mechanics, um, although the contact mechanics part will be encountered towards the end, or let's say in the second half of the topic. Um, and the reason I call it contact mechanics is because this one, this particular uh, case is a special application, an important application of the, um, let me say, general formulation or the general ideas that we will discuss in this lecture. And that pertains to uh, using a different coordinate system. We always use our Cartesian coordinate system and we establish rules for tensor operations and taking dot products of vectors, measuring distances between two points, etc. Always with respect to this nice coordinate system where I had a orthonormal basis. So we're going to discard that um, convention in this lecture and we will develop a, uh, let me say, a framework within which you could eventually uh, work with a very general basis and a basis that is strangely attached to the object. And as such, it naturally finds applications in many uh, situations like biological membrane analysis or uh, shells, or thin walled structures, um, or um, interfaces between materials which could be solid or fluids, uh, flows, thin flows between objects like let's say in theory of lubrication and, and so on and so on. So whenever you have essentially um, a dimension that is much thinner than the two remaining dimensions, so you think of something like a, let me say a sheet of paper and you want to look at step formations or you have a flow that is described in such a domain which could, could itself also be deforming, you sort of need the framework that I'm going to describe in this um, lecture. And I'm going to start with the start, make it, make it, let me say, um, um, transition into the subject by talking about the kinematics of surfaces. So I am specifically limiting ourselves to the discussion of surfaces because it's easy, easy, let me say, to visualize and sort of physically very relevant. But in fact, everything that I will talk about in this lecture pertains to the kinematics of volumes as well, where for the description of the deformation of, the, of an object in 3D, I actually make use of this strange, let me say, different coordinate system as well, a non-orthonormal basis, if you like. But I'm going to restrict ourselves, as I said, uh, to surfaces. And in that context, the topic falls into what one would call differential geometry. And so if you want to dig deeper, that would be your reference point. So um, now, the way I'm going to start the uh, topic is by drawing a picture. And because I want to talk about surfaces, I will draw a surface here. Okay. So I have a surface, and let me actually uh, um, indicate some guidelines here. And these guidelines actually are not arbitrary. Okay, let's draw them with a different color. There's a surface, and this is the, so it's the reference configuration, but not a three-dimensional domain. I'm going to pick a calligraphic capital S, not to indicate that that's the reference configuration. So this is a solid object, if you like, okay, because that's usually what we discuss. And uh, well, it's like a sheet of paper, and then I'm going to deform it, okay? It's going to move in space. But this paper is not quite extensible. Imagine it is also uh, extensible. It's like a rubber sheet, if you like. So it's going to eventually have a current configuration. And let's say the current configuration looks something like this. Okay. And so I'm going to denote it with um, 
just S. Okay, so that's the current configuration. And then um, the guidelines that I draw on the subject, these are, if you like, lines that I draw on the deformed, on the undeformed configuration, on the reference configuration. So when I stretch and uh, deform this sheet, um, the lines deform with the sheet, okay? Um, and so they are, in essence, material lines. Let's say that is the current configuration. And of course, we have our um, usual motion, where if I look at a certain point, it's going to be mapped to the current configuration. This is the referential position, capital X. This is the spatial position, small x. And then we have the motion map. I'll put a hat there for a purpose. Um, so that's the usual picture. It's what we are already familiar with, um, except that now I'm drawing a two-dimensional object. So now, these lines here, for us, they are not going to be arbitrary. So the way I'm going to think about this problem is, I'm going, I'm going to say that I have actually, so imagine this is a rectangular domain. I have another rectangular domain here, which may or may not be physically occupied by this object. So this object may never be in such a configuration. But mathematically, I can introduce a parametric domain. And in that parametric domain, I can have lines. And this is a rectangular domain. This is some map of the rectangular domain into 3D. And I, make a, I can make a one-to-one -one association between the points in this configuration, in this picture here, with the physical, let me say, referential configuration. So there is also a map that takes, that tells me, if I pick a point there, I know exactly what the referential position of that point is, or associated with that point is. Now, what I'd like to do here is introduce two coordinates that give me the position on this non-physical domain, if you like. And I'm going to call those coordinates, or indicate them with xi, so I'll write them once nicely. Let me do it large so that you see for once that I can actually draw it well, OK? So because very soon it will be messed up. Um, so I'm going to call this Xi, OK? This Xi 1, that's the convention superscript. And this is Xi 2. So those are my two coordinates. So uh, it's a picture in essence that somewhat, okay, not at well, somewhat resembles a picture that I'd drawn a long time ago. There was a reference and a spatial configuration, and there was also a body. And there was an association with the association with the particles of, of the body one-to-one -one with the referential position. The purpose of the referential position vector was to somehow get away with this concept of a set of particles that constitutes the body and instead work with position which is nicer and easier to work with. Uh, so now we have an alternative essentially because there is a one-to-one -one association with the, uh, this parametric domain and the reference configuration. And therefore, instead of identifying the material points through capital X, I can also identify them through another sort of domain, which is not our choice of the reference configuration, but in some sense, it is another non-physical reference configuration. And I can associate the particles with the parametric positions that it is associated with. So that particle is associated in the reference configuration with capital X. In the spatial configuration, it happens to occupy small x, but it is associated always with the coordinate C1, C2, okay? And this coordinate, just like capital X, it's a material point indicating. In other words, it never changes. This particle, as it moves, it occupies always different values of X, but these lines are deforming with the object, and those lines initially are um, associated with a domain on which I have parametrically linked or which I have parametrically linked to the reference configuration. So the particle always has one capital X, and therefore, 
associated with that point, there is only one pair of C1 and C2 that it is associated with. So now that means that I can alternatively take this point and make a map over here, okay, as C hat. It's a function of time always because the position depends on time. So let me also not forget that that's a vector. Um, instead of using the reference position, I will use these parametric coordinates, C1 and C2. Okay. All right. They're really, again, nothing more than lines drawn onto the object, and they get deformed, and they move, therefore, with the object. And instead of referring to the particle with its referential position, I refer them with the position that is indicated by these parametric coordinates, okay? These parametric coordinates, by the way, they are not arc lengths. In other words, this object might have a physical length of, let's say, one centimeter, but your parametric coordinates may always go from zero to one and zero to one. They've got nothing to do with arc length. So they are arbitrary, it's up to you, really. So this point here, might be physically associated with a point that in terms of centimeters could be one, three, 10, but the parametric coordinate is always from zero to one and zero to one, so this point is probably in terms of C1 and C2, something like 0.8 and 0.9, something like that, for instance, okay? So they have entirely different values. They don't have anything to do with uh, spatial length scale. Okay, so we call these points because they move with the object and because they, the, these coordinates deform according to the motion of the object, first of all, we call them convected coordinates because they move with the object. And we call them curvilinear because they are essentially curved, right? Convected curvilinear coordinates. Okay. Um, so these are material lines. Okay, but, right, because they move with the object, uh, they are attached to the material particles, the blue lines, uh, but it's not an arc length, keep that in mind. So the distance that I measure through C1 and C2, they've got nothing to do with the physical distance that I travel on the object, okay? Um, all right, so. It could be the arc length, it could be, uh, let's say with respect to the reference configuration, but that would be one very specific um, choice. Okay, so far so good. So now, uh, what I am going to do additionally is introduce a number of vectors onto that picture. And those vectors, I guess, could also be indicated with red. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce two vectors that are essentially Let's do it on this board first to, as a motivation. Um, there, there are vectors that are tangential to the surfaces. So I'm going to first pick a curve. So let's imagine that instead of a surface, I have a line that is curved in the two-dimensional space. That's a surface that is curved in the three-dimensional space. Okay? And I have the position vector here of a point x. And let's say this is the parametric direction xi. Okay, so as I increase xi, it means I travel along the um, curve. So that's a one-dimensional curvilinear coordinate for me now. Um, and therefore, xi parametrizes the position. You give me the value of xi, I know exactly where I'm at. So now what I could do is, and this is something actually that we've discussed before, what I could do is I could look at the position at a slightly different xi. So this is at xi plus delta xi. And when I do that, of course, the position changes by a certain amount, delta x, okay? Um, and so you can imagine that if I look at the ratio of, or, or if I look at delta x as delta c goes to zero, this vector is going to be something that is tangential to this curve at this point, because when delta c goes to zero, the blue point approaches the black point, okay? Okay, so when I move back to this picture, um, I will introduce two 
vectors okay. on the reference configuration G, okay, and there's a reason why I pick capital G because it has to do with the reference configuration. And so it's the derivative of the position with respect to the parametric coordinate. So through that discussion, now we know that this vector has to be something that is tangential uh, to the surface. In fact, this is the one direction and that is the two direction. So this is going to be G1, tangential to the blue line um, along the one direction. And this is going to be G2, tangential to the blue line along the two direction. And likewise, here I can introduce G alpha which is del x over del xi alpha, uh, which likewise is going to be tangential to the blue line on the spatial configuration along the one direction, and G2 is going to be tangential to, at that point, okay, uh, to the blue line along the two direction. Okay? So now I have these vectors. They are tangential vectors, and therefore it also, of course, makes sense to introduce a local normal And that local normal would be capital N on the reference configuration and small n on the current configuration. And capital N would be simply, or could be obtained by, since I'm looking for the normal, I could take the cross product of one with two, that would certainly be normal to the surface, but I'd like this to be a unit vector, and therefore I will scale it by the magnitude of the cross product. And I'll likewise, I'll do something similar in that case, and small n will be g1 cross g2, and the magnitude of G1 cross G2 scales it. Now, these vectors, the normal is also important, but these vectors are particularly important. Um, these are called basis vectors which are tangential to the surface. Okay. But there is an additional name attached to them. They are called covariant basis vectors. because there is another type of basis vector that uh, we will talk about. So why are they called basis vectors? We're going to see this in a short while, but you can already see it when you look at this picture. Well, at any point in space, what I need to be able to do is describe um, any particular vector in 3D in terms of three vectors that are linearly independent. So, by this discussion, through the fact that C1 and C2 are independent coordinates, for instance, G1 and G2 are, first of all, automatically linearly independent because the coordinates run in different directions. So for sure, G1 is not equal to G2. So automatically, I have two linearly independent vectors. And then the third vector is orthogonal to those. So I have, at that point, three vectors that are orthogonal. And I'm in three-dimensional space. So any vector could be described in terms of these three vectors. Okay? So in that sense, these are basis vectors. But only these two, G1 and G2, are called covariant basis vectors because those are the ones that somehow have to do with the structure of the uh, surface. And in particular, these vectors are tangential uh, to the surface. Okay? And they will help us write any vector that is tangential to the surface at that, let's say, point. Right? So any vector that is tangential to the surface can be written in terms of these two vectors. And hence, in the tangent, let me say, space of that um, 
of that surface at that point, these are basis vectors. And likewise, these are the corresponding ones on the spatial configuration. Okay? So now what you see is a strange picture where uh, we have certainly basis vectors. They qualify as basis vectors. But this is like a triad, and it's not a constant. right? At that point, it's like that. Over here, it's like that. Over here, it's like that. Over here, it's like that. Moreover, it gets even worse on the spatial configuration because even at this point, as the object moves, the surface is going to deform, and therefore that triad is also going to continuously change its orientation with the motion of the surface. So it's a really strange and dynamic, let me say, uh, basis, unlike what we had seen before. It was always fixed, E1, E2, E3, right? So it certainly simplified our life. And now you will see how much it has simplified our life. Because as we do the calculations, you will see that many of the expressions that earlier we were familiar with, they're going to take quite different forms in the context of such a picture. Okay? Um, on the other hand, we are sort of forced to use such a new picture because I'm not trying to describe something that lives in the space. This is a three or a two-dimensional space. It's a three-dimensional space, but the object itself is inherently 2D. So I need somehow some characterization that makes use of the structure of the surface. And these vectors provide me with essentially such a structure. OK, um, one final thing, n is unit. Because I already told you that these coordinates are not arc length, these vectors, it turns out, therefore, in general, are not unit vectors. Okay? In general, these are non-unit vectors. We have to keep that in mind, and that will immediately come into the picture um, shortly. Um, all right, good. Question so far with this picture, because that is pretty much uh, the most important picture that we have. We introduce some basic quantities, and now I'm going to step by step manipulate those quantities systematically and develop or reintroduce, revisit concepts that we are earlier familiar with. Okay, any questions? Don't worry about the indices. I'm going to have tons of indices floating around. It's unavoidable. It's a part of this topic. Uh, what you have to notice is that we are using clearly Greek indices here. And the reason for that is we want to, as soon as we see this notation, I'd like to remind myself, oh, alpha runs from 1 to 2. It's not i, j, k, which always runs from 1 to 3. So I tell myself, oh, OK, I'm dealing with a structure that is two-dimensional, but inherently two-dimensional because it's a surface, but one that is embedded in 3D. So there is some three-dimensional coordinate lying somewhere out there as well, but um, the inherent co coordinates of the surface are two-dimensional. The structure of the surface is two-dimensional. OK, um, so now let me manipulate those objects one by one. So first of all, um, I told you that those vectors are not unit vectors. And therefore, when I take this product, it's not going to be Kronecker delta. It's going to be something else. We will call it capital G alpha beta. Okay? And likewise, if I take the dot product on the spatial configuration, again, they are not going to be unit vectors. They are not unit vectors, and therefore it's not a Kronecker delta. It's something else. These are called the components of a so-called metric tensor. Okay, and we have called these vectors covariant vectors, and therefore. These are the covariant components of the metric. Again, what's the alternative? We're going to see uh, very, very shortly. All right. So now, once we have those at hand, uh, now let me move on. Suppose, now I'm going to operate solely with the spatial configuration quantity, so small g's, uh, because I find it, uh, let me say, more uh, well, faster to write somehow and less busy instead of 
capital letters screaming at me. Um, so I'm going to stick to the spatial ones, but whatever I do, I could be doing in terms of the referential ones. So keep that in mind, okay? So I'm going to pick the, uh, I, I could be doing in terms of the referential ones, I'm going to pick the spatial ones. So just keep that in mind. So for instance, I'm going to take G alpha beta, I could be taking the capital one, doesn't matter. And I'm going to put them into a matrix. So it's a two by two matrix, right? G one, 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 two, two, one, two, two. Okay, now first of all, you can notice that this is symmetric because one, two, two, one, doesn't matter. It gives me the same value and that's important. So this matrix that is composed of the components of the matrix, matrix tensor, gives rise to a symmetry, okay? So G is symmetric um, and now what I can do is I can take the inverse of G and let me indicate the components of that inverse with a bar, okay? Just due to lack of anything better. And this is therefore also symmetric, right? Because the inverse of a symmetric, tense is symmetric matrix is also symmetric. Now, so the components of the inverse, they are components 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, etc. of G bar. Okay, so these are the components of the inverse. But I don't want to carry this bar around. I'd like to have a slightly simpler uh, notation. And the convention is to discard the bar, but to highlight that this is not the original G alpha, but it has to do with the components of the inverse of G, I will put a superscript instead of a subscript, okay? So that's the convention. So these are also components of something that is closely related to the metric tensor, but these are not called covariant, but rather called contravariant. metric components, okay? So the contravariant components are the components that you obtain by inverting the matrix that is composed of the covariant components. Okay. All right, good. So that's also a just a convention, nothing more than that, right? I'm sort of defining things at this stage, right? We haven't seen any of this before. It's just a series of definitions. And let me continue with the definitions. I had a base, a, a vector, a covariant vector, G beta, right? G1 and G2. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take their linear combination by using the components of the covariant matrix, okay? Um, so, so now, for instance, if alpha is one, it would be G one two, G two, or G plus G one one, G one, etc. So I'm taking a linear combination, and for every alpha, it delivers me a new vector, and that vector I will call G superscript alpha, okay? Because now it's not equal to G subscript alpha. It's a new vector. It's a linear combination of the covariant ones, and this is called because these are called covariant, and now I'm operating on them with the contravariant components, these are called contravariant basis vectors, okay? Contravariant, covariant, very soon your mind will be saturated with these uh, words, but don't worry. will eventually obtain uh, useful constructs. Okay, so now what you can show, I'm leaving a few exercises, actually short exercises for you. What you can show is that by taking a linear combination of the covariant vectors through the contravariant components of the metric, I obtain the contravariant basis and therefore you might think that if I take the linear combination of the contravariant vectors, sub superscripts, by making use of the covariant metric components, I will obtain 
the covariant vectors. And indeed, that is true. Okay? So that you can show. Now here, we observe a convention that perhaps we will not have a lot of, um, let me say, chances to, let me say, uh, practice with. But it's certainly a convention that works. And what we notice is that if I take a quantity, and have a look here for a second. If I take a quantity and it has a subscript as an index, okay, um, and if I operate it with the contravariant components, so it has two upper indices, then the upper cancels this lower one, and I'm left with only upper one. So the index of the quantity I'm dealing with is sort of raised. Okay, so now on the other hand, here if you look, there is an upper index and then there are two lower components. This beta cancels that beta and I'm left with a lower index, okay? So here I have index lowering. We're going to see at least one or two more examples to this, right? Um, and if we keep that in mind, then um, we can follow the definitions more smoothly because these are, after all, definitions I had earlier, did not know of such a quantity, but now I define it. I look here and I cancel these two indices. I'm left with the upper index, so I define G upper index alpha, and now that's a quantity that is different from G lower index alpha. It's entirely different, and likewise, the same thing over there. Okay, and these vectors are, by the way, also tangent to the surface because these are also tangent, right? These are, by definition, tangent vectors. If I take any linear combination of them, their combination is also tangent to the surface. Okay, so these contravariant basis vectors are also tangent to the surface. Um, all right, good. So um, let me proceed and show you a number of identities that are associated with combinations of covariant and contravariant basis vectors. So the first of these is, let's say, observe that, for instance, when I take the inner product of G alpha super G sub beta, right? So first of all, if both are lower, then I get the components of the metric. If both are upper, I don't know what I have yet. I will show you in a second, but again, it's probably not going to be Kronecker delta, okay? But if I look at that, let's see what we obtain. Well, first of all, I know what G alpha is. G alpha is a linear combination of the covariant vectors, right? So I introduced a new index gamma, okay? So I wrote G alpha as such. Dotted with G beta. Now, G alpha G beta, it's by definition G gamma beta, okay? And now, therefore, I have G alpha gamma G gamma beta. So now, this is equal to, okay, in terms of components, the product of the matrix that is composed of the covariant matrix multiplying its inverse. This is what that indicates. So inverse matrix itself, Kronecker delta, its identity. So this is equal to delta. But now, this index cancels that one, so we will write that Kronecker delta carefully. One index above, one index below, okay? So I'm going to circle this. Let's be careful with where the indices are. But what matters is what it means. It means that it's Kronecker delta, right? So it turns out that the Kronecker delta property among the basis vector still holds, but not among contravariant and covariant among themselves, but between a choice of the contra and a choice of the covariant vector, okay? So, all right, well, let's move on. Um, let us look at, look at now G alpha dot G beta, and you might already guess what that's going to reveal. So I'm going to uh, substitute the 
like I did there, an expression for the contravariant one, the same expression, and then dotted with G beta. So now I have shown that this dot product is Kronecker delta gamma beta. Kronecker delta property always holds, so I have alpha gamma gamma beta. So this is going to be, I can get rid of that gamma with that gamma, and I'm going to be left with G. Sorry, there is no line here. I'm going to be left with alpha beta. Okay? So if you take the dot product of two contravariant vectors, alpha beta, you get end up with the components of the contravariant metric, okay, or the contravariant components of the metric tensor. If you were to do that with the covariant vectors, you end up with the com covariant components. Okay, so it's a very similar structure, but one that we are building uh, step by step. Okay, we are sort of proving these things. Um, so now let me draw you a picture um, of how these vectors are geometrically related to each other. So suppose I'm at a certain position in space, let's say that position is x, and I have my coordinates running like this. Let's say this is c2, and this is c1, okay? So at that point, that's how the lines run. Of course, these lines run all over the place and they parametrize the whole surface. I'm just looking in the vicinity of one point. So now, if I look at the covariant vector g1, it is tangential to the one direction, g subscript one, by construction. Covariant vector two, is tangential to the second parametric coordinate by construction. But I already told you, because these lines after deformation, in fact, even in the undeformed state, they don't need to be perpendicular, but in particular after deformation, they don't have to be uh, perpendicular to each other at all. So these lines don't run perpendicular to each other. So these vectors are not necessarily perpendicular to each other. And that's indeed what we have observed in the definition of the metric components. I hand up with G1 dot G2 is G subscript 1, 2. It's not Kronecker delta, it's not zero, okay? And we see that here, okay? These are not necessarily orthogonal to each other. Um, so on the other hand, right, if I have G2, G2 should be perpendicular to G superscript 2, should be perpendicular to G1, because there is a Kronecker delta property between them. So if I draw G2, it is perpendicular to this one, okay? And if I draw G superscript one, it is perpendicular to that one because there is a Kronecker delta between the green and the blue G2, okay? So that picture holds, right? So that's a geometric depiction of what we have so far. It sort of summarizes everything, right? Now, there is something slightly, in this context, it shouldn't be, but I highlight it nevertheless. Let's note here, if I take G1, for instance, right? If I take G1 super dot G subscript one, the result is delta one one, it's one. Okay. The fact that it's one clearly doesn't mean that they are in the same direction. They are not parallel, okay? But nevertheless, the dot product is one, right? Earlier when we had two you know, basis vectors and the dot product is one, it meant that they are in the same direction, but not anymore, right? So the dot product is one, and I've proved it, but they are not in the same direction. So this is the picture what I have. I just wrote this, um, and let me highlight that note. This 
doesn't mean G1 is parallel to G subscript 1. OK. All right, so um, now from this picture, I'm going to finally show something that's also going to be uh, useful. Now, G1 is the variation of x with respect, or characterizes the variation of x with respect to C1. This one variation with respect to C2. Okay. Now, could one somehow write the question? That's the question. Could one somehow write the contravariant vectors, green and black vectors in some similar fashion. And that's what I'm going to show here. And to show that, I'm start, going to start with the chronicle delta representation. And I'm going to write it as del xi alpha over del xi beta. So these are two coordinates. And therefore, unless alpha is equal to beta, of course, the result is equal to um, 0. And now I'm going to apply the chain rule to this. So this is del xi alpha. Now, I'm moving along the surface, and therefore, I could uh, somehow parametrize the values or inverse parametrize, let me say, find the values of C for a given x, and so apply the chain rule in that fashion. So it's still the same derivative. I've just thrown an x in the middle. Nothing changes. But now, when I look at that derivative, I notice that this thing here is the covariant vector g beta. And the outcome is Kronecker delta. And g beta, if it's dotted with something, if it's giving Kronecker delta, this thing here must be g alpha. Okay. Okay. So that is a nice expression for the contravariant vector. The covariant one is the variation of position with respect to the coordinates. The contravariant one is the variation of the parametric coordinates with respect to position. So it's, uh, there's somehow a conceptual inverse, which of course uh, is apparent in the, even in the construction of these vectors because I multiplied this or took a linear combination in terms of the inverse of the metric components to build that vector. So that is somehow expected. All right, so that, 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 is, that is an expression. Both of these I'm going to make use of again and again. All right, we are pretty much done with the basic construction of the vectors, what metric components mean, and eventually the geometric interpretation of the individual sets of basis vectors, and that is a depiction of that geometric structure. Okay, so now, why do we have basis vectors? Why do we introduce them? Because we'd like to be able to describe vectors in terms of basis vectors. So let's go ahead and see how that happens. So if I have the surface, again, I am going to limit myself to the current configuration. And I want to describe a tangential vector at a given point. The tangential vector physically means it's a vector. Imagine at that point, I draw a plane that is tangential to the surface at that point. Okay, It just barely touches it. And it's flat, so that's a flat surface. This is sometimes referred to as the tangent space associated with that point. So it's essentially a plane that is tangent to this curved space. Um, so now when I say a tangent vector, I mean a vector that lives in the green plane. Okay, that's what I mean by it. So here, let's say pick any um, tangential vector. And let's call it v. Okay. And I'd like to be able to depict the vector in terms of the basis vectors. Okay. So the convention is as such. Okay. And the convention is always 
when you write a vector in terms of components and corresponding bases, if there is one upper, the other one should be lower. That's the convention. So similarly, if I were to write this, this is another choice. Instead of V upper, I like V lower, and then G must be an upper one. Right? Um, these are called the, so these are certainly components of the vector. These are called contravariant components, right? Because they have upper indices, if you like. And these are called covariant components. Of the same vector, okay? It's just they are different components because the basis is changing. So what we should recognize is because the basis is different, the components are not going to be the same, of course. Okay. Now, given the basis and the vector, how would we calculate those components? Well, the way one does it is similar to what we had done before. So for instance, you'd like to obtain the covariant components. So what you do is you take a inner product of the vector with the covariant vector. Okay? That's what will deliver this component. So to see that uh, that is the case, let me write V as such. Okay? So that's V. I used that representation dotted with G alpha. G beta, G alpha, it's Kronecker delta beta alpha, which is equal to V alpha. So the covariant components come from the inner product of the vector with the covariant vector. So similarly, if I were to do that, and now I can use the alternative representation. Now I have V beta, delta, alpha, beta. Again, from Kronecker delta, I will obtain V superscript alpha. So the Contravariant components come from the vector dotted with the contravariant basis vectors. Now, here's something else you can show, and uh, it pertains to index lowering and raising that we have seen before. You can show that V alpha could be obtained as a linear combination of, v, of the contravariant components by taking a linear combination of them in terms of the metric tensor, the covariant one. Or V superscript alpha is equal to G superscript alpha beta V beta. Okay? So I had earlier mentioned index raising and lowering by making use of the components of the metric, the proper one. And the same thing applies here. There are two betas. Alpha is the remaining one. It's a lower index, so it lowers the index of the component. And likewise, for the alternative one, okay? So this is a convention that always holds and this one is something you should um, and you can um, prove. All right, good. So now I know how to obtain different components of the same vector with respect to different basis sets, okay? Covariant or contravariant one. Um, now let's go ahead and also take an inner product of the vector with itself. I'm going to take the inner product with itself, okay? Or I could, for that matter, really pick any two vectors, but I'm going to pick this vector itself. So I'm going to look at v dot v. And I'm going to do this in several different ways. So always what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a representation from here 
and plug it in there. So v dot v, let's start with the first one. I'm going to pick that representation, v alpha, g alpha, dotted with. Now I have to pick another notation. I picked v beta, g beta, another index. And that's equal to v alpha, metric g alpha beta, v beta. Um, or I can pick the other representation and obtain V alpha G alpha beta V beta. So earlier in the context of orthonormal coordinates, when I dotted a vector with itself, it was VI, VI, right? In 3D. V dot V is VI, VI, right? But here, it's not, let's say, V alpha, V alpha, if the indices are both upper or the indices are both lower. So the metric tensor comes into play, and that's essentially where it, its name comes from. Metric, remember, it's a measure of distance or it's associated with inner products telling, how, telling us how things are oriented with respect to one another. So the metric tensor tells us how to properly calculate the inner product if you choose indices that are matching-wise raised or lowered. Okay? So this is not equal to V alpha, V alpha, or V alpha, V alpha. So the metric tensor um, gives information on the proper, let me say, calculation of the inner product. Now, however, there is something very nice, and that something that's nice is the following. If you look here and look at these results, this will lower the index of V and give us V subscript alpha, or if I look here, this will raise the index of this V and give me V superscript alpha. So both of them are, in fact, equal to that. So this doesn't hold. So in other words, when the indices are likewise upper or lower, it doesn't work out. But if one is upper and one is lower, then the structure that we are used to somehow is still there. Okay? But you just have to be careful with the components that you're working with. OK, so that was pretty much the tough part. So uh, we've established the most important ingredients. And now we are going to make use of these ingredients uh, repeatedly. And I will do so by starting with um, calculus operations on the surface. Suppose I'd like to take gradients or divergences. How would we do that? And essentially, that's something we have to do if we want to eventually formulate balanced laws on such a surface, because balanced laws um, somehow, as we have experienced, require evaluating divergences and gradients. And so let me say calculus operations on S can um, be, let's say, easily developed. And I will do this uh, rather fast because it's usually just a matter of taking careful or applying the chain rule carefully. I'll start with the gradient. And let's say we have a scalar field, phi, on the surface. Okay? Um, and I'm always picking the spatial configuration again. You could do everything that I've done, including the representation of a vector 
on the reference configuration uh, as well, if that's a referential vector. Uh, I'm always picking one configuration, and that's the spatial configuration to give some examples, right? So in this case, it's a scalar field on the, ref, on the, on the spatial configuration. So um, now, in any case, it lives on the surface, and the surface is naturally described in terms of the parametric coordinates. So when I talk about the value of phi, I like to talk about the value of phi at a given parametric coordinate. So when I take the gradient, the surfaces in 3D, so I can think that I'm still applying the gradient in the fashion that I am familiar with, with the exception, with the exception that the field is living on the surface and that is characterized or parametrized by the coordinates. So when I take derivatives, I should be taking derivatives with respect to the position on the surface, so with respect to C alpha. So this is how I now apply the chain rule. Okay. Um, so the second vector now we have observed is nothing but the contravariant basis G alpha, and therefore the chain rule reveals that the gradient is equal to that result. Okay. okay. So the divergence is likewise not hard, just slightly more involved. Let's also do that. And my purpose here at this stage is to sort of manipulate these expressions so that you see some terminology that typically appears in the context of differential geometry when you want to work, for instance, with uh, or when you want to work on curved surfaces, okay? And one such important terminology is going to appear very soon in the context of divergence. So now I'm going to take a tangential vector, right? So for gradient, I picked a scalar because that's easy. When I want to talk about divergence, I need to have at least a vector. I like to evaluate the um, divergence. And again, the idea is you apply the chain rule. So the chain rule is, so first of all, the divergence operation we had discussed earlier um, at the beginning of the course um, is expressed as such. But now V is a tangential vector and therefore everything is parametrized naturally in terms of not X but rather the two parametric coordinates of the surface, C1 and C2. And therefore I'm going to apply a chain rule here. So I'm going to write a derivative of V first with respect to C alpha and then dotted with the derivative of C alpha with respect to X. Okay. So again, careful application of the chain rule. So the First vector, first of all, this one, that's easy. Again, it's always the contravariant one popping up again. It's contravariant vector of G alpha. Um, so now here I need to be a little bit careful because V is a tangential vector. Let me indicate that as such, okay? Components and the basis. Now I want to take a derivative of that expression derivative of V beta G beta. And that is equal to, first, the derivative of the components with respect to C alpha and multiplying the basis, plus the components, the derivative of the basis with respect to C alpha. Now the space, the, the surface is curved. As I move along the surface, right? That's my surface. This is a covariant vector that is at some point tangent to the surface. Let's say it's tangent like that. When I move along the surface, the orientation of the vector is going to change. And therefore, this is a derivative that is not equal to zero. The vector, both the magnitude and the orientation, can depend on the position. In fact, 
even if it's flat, because of the choice of your parametric coordinates, it might happen that this g beta, let's say, is always in that direction. Direction doesn't change, but it can stretch or contract, depending on how you have distributed your coordinates onto the surface. It can happen. So even if the surface is flat, this is not necessarily equal to zero. So in any case, that's a term that remains. And now, therefore, I take the dot product of those vectors, okay? So I have, well, let's observe. V beta, xi alpha, G beta, G alpha. That's a Kronecker delta alpha beta. I'm going to make that an alpha. So del V alpha over del xi alpha. And then plus V beta, the dot of this, with G alpha. All right, so I have two expressions there. Now, in parentheses, I am going to define an object. And this definition is denoted like this. It's a gamma, capital gamma, one upper, lower upper index, two lower indices. And this is defined as Okay, similar to that structure, G beta over del xi gamma dot G alpha. So there is an alpha beta gamma, alpha beta gamma. Okay. And these quantities are called Christoffel symbols. And they arise whenever you work on curved surfaces. And they are called Christoffel symbols of the second kind because there are Christoffel symbols of the first kind that we're not going to mention here. Okay? Now, the fact that you see an object that has three indices, it's tempting to think that this is perhaps the components of some one, two, three, third order tensor. It turns out it's not. This is just a set of components that do not, let me say, uh, physically or mathematically have to do with any tensor. In fact, it doesn't transform the way the components of a tensor should transform. For instance, you can remember, when I change bases, a second order tensor, the components have to transform in a certain fashion. You have shown it all the way back in homework number two. So whenever you have a tensor, its components need to transform in a certain fashion. It turns out these things don't transform properly, so these are not components of a third order tensor. Okay? Um, but in any case, it is useful for us because now I can go and observe that the quantity that I have here is equal to precisely gamma beta, and instead of gamma, again, I have alpha, alpha, alpha. Oops, sorry. Gamma alpha, beta alpha, right. Okay. So beta is there, right. Okay. And therefore, I have the whole thing equal to beta alpha. Um, now, does it make sense, the result? It does. It does make sense in the following way. Uh, the divergence of a vector should be a scalar, so there should be no free indices. So there are no free indices. Beta and alpha, they are both summed over. But in 3D, we always had something like vi comma i. So in this case, we might expect v alpha comma alpha, which would be that term, but no, we get something additional. And that additional term has to do with the fact that, right, the tangent vectors, the basis, tangential basis vectors are somehow changing as you move across the surface. So it has to do with, again, the structure of the surface. It has to do with the fact that you have some strange coordinate system on that surface. So this is a, let me say, unexpected term. Okay, let me put an exclamation mark. 
So if you apply your, you know, um, let me say, our trained convention that we have followed up until this week, this is perhaps the thing that we would be tempted to write, but no, it's wrong, there is something additional. All right, so we've covered the um, gradient and the divergence. And we have only a few more things left uh, before we are done with the most important ingredients of dealing with the structure of surfaces. Okay? And one last thing I'd like to mention uh, about the, let me say, the structure has to do with the curvature of the surface. So curvature is a concept that you always hear, and we understand what it is. It means that it's not flat. There's some curve on the surface. And there is a mathematical way of characterizing that. So, and that characterization has to do with, again, essentially um, that vector, okay? So I told you that whether or not the surface is curved, this, is not necessarily equal to zero. However, the variation of the vector with respect to the parametric coordinate will have a component that is perpendicular to the surface, okay? So this derivative will have a component perpendicular to the surface, it turns out, and this is something you can also geometrically argue even in 2D, only if it has a curvature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that thing and look at its normal component. If it's not zero, it means the space is curved, okay? So I'm going to do that over here. So I'm going to look at the normal component of the variation of a basis vector. In this case, I haven't chosen the contravariant, but the covariant one, with respect to C, okay? And I'm saying that this has a normal component, so the outcome is non-zero only if the space is curved. And I'm going to call this B alpha beta, and it turns out these are the components of a tensor, okay? And the tensor is B. All right, well, uh, now this tensor is a special tensor because it turns out that it is symmetric, and there is an easy way to see that it is symmetric, and that immediately comes from that expression. G alpha is del x over del c alpha, okay? Now I put one more derivative, so two derivatives with respect to the coordinates, that's what that corresponds to. But it doesn't matter how I write this. So in other words, first I could take a derivative with respect to beta, and then with respect to alpha, then I would obtain del g de beta del c alpha. So when I switch the coordinates, or the indices, sorry, um, the outcome does not change, and that's where the symmetry comes from. It comes from the structure of this expression. All right. So that's a symmetric quantity, and that's good to know. And again, let me make a note that this is uh, non-zero if S is curved. And now we'd like to characterize what that curvature is, okay? So versus it is zero if S is flat, right? Um, and let's look at its eigenvalues. Okay, I'm going to look at the eigenvalues of this tensor. The tensor itself is B. I'm going to pick a tangential vector and operate on it, and I'm going to hope that it satisfies that equation. So that's a classical eigenvalue problem. All right, well, let me go ahead and write the components of these tensors and vectors. So I'm going to write B as alpha, gamma, okay? 
So when I want to now express that tensor, I will attach to it the basis. The basis will be G alpha bond G gamma, okay? Just as we did always. But these are two lower indices, and therefore, following the expressions of vectors, I have to attach a basis that is the vector where the vectors have upper indices so that these are properly positioned. So this is always the rule. When the components are lower, the corresponding basis has an upper index and vice versa. If these components were placed above, these would be placed below, etc. So that's the expression for G. Okay, and sorry, so this is supposed to be gamma. All right, well, um, then I'll write V. Uh, let's pick the expression V beta G beta, okay? And for V on the right-hand side, I'm going to write V alpha G alpha. And I'm going to multiply things out here, okay? So I'm going to obtain B alpha gamma G gamma dotted with G beta, which will give me G gamma beta, left with V beta, and G alpha remains where it is. That's the left-hand side. Now, I'm going to define this to be something new. Okay, and I'm going to use always the idea of index raising lowering. There is a lower index alpha, there is a gamma that is shared with this gamma, and there is a beta that is placed up there, so I'm going to write a quantity B alpha beta, which is different from what I had here, because one index is lower, one index is better. Okay, so this one one is not equal to this one one. Okay, it's a new quantity and it's constructed like this. Okay, uh, and with that definition, Okay, so that's my definition now. Okay. I'm going to write the eigenvalue problem as such. Okay. So now I look here and I see for every choice of alpha, V alpha times kappa must be equal to what is on the left hand side and that is B alpha beta V beta. So B alpha beta V beta must be equal to kappa V alpha. Or what I can do is I can take these and put them into vector form. I can write, put the components of this B into a matrix, two by two, these into a vector, two by one, kappa vector. And that's a standard eigenvalue problem of linear algebra. And I can crank out the eigenvalues through the characteristic equation, right? The characteristic equation is, kappa squared minus b11 plus b22 kappa minus b11 b22 minus b21 b12 equals zero. Here, instead of defining invariants, et cetera, I've just made use of standard linear algebra. Just two by two, what I said is B minus K identity should have zero determinant. I evaluated the determinant and obtained the characteristic equation. So this, you see, looks like the trace of this matrix, and this is essentially the determinant of that matrix, okay? So it has a very standard structure, and of course it has two roots, and it turns out that those two roots are guaranteed to be real. That's a proof, a uh, short proof on its own. But let's believe that result. And um, the values, kappa one and kappa two, in other words, the two eigenvalues of this matrix B, or the eigenvalue problem that I have written here, the two eigenvalues, are called the principal curvatures of the surface, 
at the point that I'm at. Okay? So now, after all of the, that manipulation, this is the first time that some additional clear, uh, let me say, geometric interpretation emanates from all of this machinery. I see the word curvature and I know what that means, right? Um, so, Kappa 1 and Kappa 2 are the principal curvatures. Uh, their combinations, in a certain sense, have special names. For instance, if you take their product, it's called the Gaussian curvature. And if you take their mean, it's called the mean curvature. And these, by themselves, uh, appear specifically in certain manipulations. Now, this curvature, it's not something very fancy. It's something that you already know and we can easily, easily visualize in 1D. So let's imagine we have a one-dimensional curve. Okay. That goes like this. This is by parametric direction, C. So I have a origin somewhere. I'm in 2D. So one dimensional geometry embedded in 2D. And when I take derivatives, I can obtain the tangential, the covariant vectors, and then contravariant, et cetera. Um, so, um, so, so now, um, I also need a normal, and the choice of the normal is important. The normal is going to be, in this case, defined as, this is my choice as such. So the normal goes like this at every point. Okay. Always pointing towards the top of the surface. Okay. Um, and the curvature is now, if you evaluate the curvature with this definition, right, the choice of the normal is important because it goes into the definition of B, right? If you choose it in the opposite direction, the eigenvalues will essentially change um, sign. But it turns out with that choice, in that region up to here, roughly up to here, kappa is greater than zero, positive curvature. Here it curves down, it has negative curvature up to roughly here. Again, here it's sort of, it's like an up-facing right, curve. Here it's again greater than zero, and at some point it is equal to zero. And these are inflection points where kappa is again equal to zero. Okay. Now, uh, well, what is kappa? I mean, do we understand what it is in the context of a very simple example? And a very simple example comes from a circle. If I have a circle, okay, that is stationed like this, okay, I need to have a normal, and my normal is going to be defined following this convention. It's going to be defined like this, and of course I do need a coordinate. The coordinate can be anything. Why not choose it to be the angular orientation, theta, okay? Theta runs from zero to two pi, or in fact, you can rotate as much as you like. That is going to be my choice of the parametric coordinate. And with that, using actually the machinery that you already have developed probably in your first undergraduate dynamics course, you can calculate tangential vector, normal vectors, parametrize it in terms of the position, the position which is parametrized in terms of C, and work out everything that is needed for the calculation of the curvature. And it turns out, if the radius of this, sorry, if the radius of the circle is R, the curvature with this choice of the normal and this direction of C is equal to one over R. Okay. So the curvature is not really sort of radius, it's one over the radius, and for that reason, one over kappa, the inverse of kappa in general, it is called the radius of curvature. 
The choice of the normal is important. You switch it, kappa will be negative. So curvature, yes, it can become negative. You keep the normal, you switch the direction, the curvature will again be negative. You switch both, the curvature will become positive, etc. So the curvature is not necessarily something that's positive. It can become negative, and indeed, that's what we see over there as well. Okay? So this radius of curvature also has a geometric interpretation. If I look at a certain point, okay, let's say that point, now, the curve here is certainly not following the surface of a circle. However, the interpretation of the radius of curvature, and let's say, let's call it R, means that if I want to approximate the geometry of the curve in the vicinity of that point, in the roughest manner possible, of course, it would be a line. But that would be a terrible approximation, the tangent line. The next level would be something that is curved. And that is a circle. So a circle which has a radius r equals 1 over kappa, kappa being the curvature at that point, is a local approximation to the geometry of the curve in the vicinity of that point, but just in the vicinity of that point. Because if you go far away, you see that the green line and the red line deviate from each other. So that is the meaning of the radius of curvature. It tells us that we can fit locally a circle in the vicinity of that point. Okay. Um, all right, good. I do encourage you to sort of parameterize the position, right? The position of that put would be, point would be r times so cosine theta of multiplying E1 plus sine theta multiplying E2, right? You could write that position vector, and now theta appears explicitly, R doesn't change. You can take derivatives, calculate the covariant bases, and so on and so forth. You can calculate all of that and find that kappa is equal to one over R. I encourage you to verify that. Okay, so we have a little bit more, and then we'll be done with the, the basic kinematics of um, surfaces. Um, so, we've done all of this, and uh, we understand how this machinery helps us characterize the geometry of the surface. We can take derivatives and gradients and divergences on the, on the surface. Um, and if I wanted to move on to the description of the deformation, and the stress that is associated with that deformation, and if I wanted to eventually write balance laws associated with those stresses, etc., I need to characterize stresses in terms of deformation gradient. So deformation gradient is a concept that I need to also develop for such a surface. Because, as we know, it is a central concept towards the description of um, balance laws. So I'm going to talk about the surfacial deformation gradient. Now, the deformation gradient, it's always what it is. So when I write F, it's going to be del X over del capital X. Now, what we're trying to do in the context of what I have chosen to do here is only work with vectors that live in the tangent space of a point, right? That tangential vectors. So when I write a tensor, I am structuring them with my particular choice to expose the main ideas in such a way that they can operate only on vectors that are tangential to the surface. They have no effect on normal vectors. So here I will write all tensors operate on tangential vectors. That's my choice. It simplifies our life a little bit. So when I write f, 
therefore I've called it the surfacial deformation gradient. And now I will proceed with this construction as follows. Now, the idea doesn't change. So conceptually, it's del xi, del capital XA, EI bond EA in terms of, um, in terms of the um, usual orthonormal basis. But now, I cannot really evaluate these derivatives per se because I inherently should be making of use of the surface parametric coordinates. So instead of taking a derivative with respect to xa, I'm going to take a derivative with respect to the parametric coordinate first, and then the parametric coordinate with respect to xa. Then ei bond ea. And now when I look at the structure, I see derivative of a vector with respect to C alpha, the vector is xi ei, and the derivative of the parametric coordinate with respect to components of a vector, the vector is xa ea. So in other words, I can combine these two, and I can combine these two. The first one into del x over del c alpha, and the second one into del C alpha over del capital X. Okay? And this is nothing but G alpha. And the second one is nothing but, now we have not done this, but it follows in the same fashion. It is the contravariant basis vector, but on the reference configuration. So it's G superscript alpha. And therefore, what we found out is that the surfacial deformation gradient is, I'm sorry, this is subscript. The surfacial deformation gradient is G alpha bun G capital G superscript alpha. Okay, that's a very simple expression. You don't even see components, right? It's just bun of two vectors. Very simple expression. So it's strange. Where is the deformation information? The deformation information is in the vectors, okay? This one is a constant, but with deformation, this one continuously evolves and incorporates everything about deformation. It's in there, right, implicitly. Um, all right, well, um, so now, one, now that we have the deformation gradient, you might worry about what its inverse is, what its transpose. The transpose is simple. You always switch the basis vectors. It follows the same rule. But if I want to worry about the inverse, I better know what identity is, because FF inverse should be equal to identity, right? So let me first write what identity is. And this one we're going to write by observation. I'm going to write it, and we're going to argue that it does make sense. And the identity has several different and equivalent expressions. So, this is the first one. And what I'm going to choose to do is, I'm going to write several, and it would be a good exercise if you went ahead and tried to show these. I'll give you a hint as to, some of, as to how some of these could be carried out. So, this is the first one, and let me write another one. So, it comes in many, many different forms, but they are all the same. And in fact, I move on. So the identity in many disguises, right? 
Um, and I'm writing the identity on S. Likewise, I could write the identity on the referential configuration. Um, all right, well, um, so the identity has components that have to do with the Kronecker delta, that structure you see here, okay? Or it's in 3D, it's EI bond EI. But when you choose the basis vectors and its indices, we have to be careful. If one is lower, it turns out the other one is upper, upper lower. If they are the same, what's in between is not Kronecker delta anymore on the surface. It has to do with the metric tensor. So what we see is that the components of the so-called metric tensor are associated with actually the components of nothing more than the identity on a surface. Because if I want to construct a tensor out of these components, these are upper indices, so I would attach a basis that are lower indices. So that is my tensor. This is the metric tensor, and it's nothing but the identity, right? So, These are metric tensor components. One is contravariant, one is covariant, but both have to do with the identity. And we remember they are both symmetric because the identity has to be symmetric, right? Uh, the components, when I switch them, they don't change. If you want to show this, let me give you a hint. Uh, what you could do, for instance, is you could write that term as G alpha beta G beta. That is the definition of the contravariant basis. And then you could go ahead and do many manipulations. For instance, here I have a G beta. I keep that there. And G superscript alpha beta G alpha, it will raise the index of this and make it alpha cancels beta. You obtain that expression, okay? Or what you could do is you keep G beta there and you keep G alpha there. And in between, you have G alpha beta and that's there and so on. So you could show, based on that, all of those expressions that I have uh, written there. So now, do we believe that that is the identity? Let's finally show that, and then we are done. And I'm going to just pick uh, one verification. So, if I take a tangential vector, identity operates on it. I expect to obtain the vector itself. So I could pick, for instance, that representation. Okay. That's identity, and it will now operate on V. And let's pick for V this representation. So when this operates, I will have G alpha, G beta, that is delta alpha beta. And then beta indices will cancel. I will have V alpha left, V alpha, G alpha. V alpha, G alpha. That's one choice. What I could have also done is, among many other choices, I could have also picked the alternative representation for the identity, switching upper and lower. And with that, I could pick also the alternative representation of B, of sorry, V. And then I could look at these two terms. Again, they will be the Kronecker delta when they are dotted. And then I will be left with V alpha and G alpha, okay? In both cases, it is equal to V. So no matter how you work out, IV comes out to be V. And finally, now that I know what the identity is, I can verify that F inverse is also of a very simple form and it looks like that, okay? So F is G, small g, subscript, bond, capital G, superscript alpha. So when you calculate F immerse, you switch the upper and lower cases, essentially. So does that work? Well, let's see. F, F inverse should be equal to identity. First, I write F 
that's a surfacial gradient tensor. And then I claim that F inverse of that is of that form. So G beta 1, G beta. The rules that we have developed for operations between tensors, they still hold. So when I want to carry out that operation, I need to take the dot product of these two inner vectors. And that's going to be nothing but delta alpha beta. And therefore, I'm going to be left with G alpha, use the substitution property on that beta, and that's equal to G alpha bond G alpha, and that's equal to identity. Okay. So now we've um, pretty much covered the most crucial parts that have to do with um, a surface deformation. We've described the mathematics behind it, which is a generalization of the choice of the basis vectors that we had followed earlier. Those made our life much, much easier. Now you see that we have to deal with upper and lower indices and with basis vectors that depend on the deformation. But we're stuck with this because that is the geometry of deformation and we have to somehow respect it. And once you sort of get accustomed to this structure, in fact, it pays out immensely. Choosing the seemingly easier way would be untractable in the long term if you want to do, carry out anything theoretical or numerical for that purpose. So, and we've come down to, in the end, the description of the deformation gradient. And with that now, one could move, right? That's the first step in the discussion of strains. We could define strain tensors. Once we have strain and we know how to take stresses, uh, or, sorry, divergences. We could talk about balance laws. We could talk about how the stress that appears in the balance law is associated with, let me say, the deformation gradient, constant formulation. Everything in the context of surfaces, depending on your particular uh, area of interest. So that would be the starting point to dig deeper into the kinematics and kinetics of anything that has to do with a lower dimensional geometry in this case, a surface embedded in a three-dimensional geometry. Okay? Um, but we're not going to do that. Right? So what we're going to do next time is, as I've said, the topic was contact mechanics. Contact mechanics is one particular area that finds a neat application of the tools that we have developed here. And I'm going to give you some uh, simple application of at least some of the concepts that have appeared here. And we're going to analyze actually how that would help us, contact mechanics would help us look at, again, uh, material behavior, but not fluid, uh, not solid. Well, it is somewhat solid, but it's not a continuum per se. It's granular medium, something like sand okay, or soil. Okay? Uh, how we would describe that, um, the, the behavior of such a material, strange material, um, where these tools are inherently made use of, okay? And that's the content of next time, so thank you. <laughs>